Hey you, and welcome. My name is Mike, and in this solo video, we are looking at a pair of star-crossed... Kill because when two young folk saw people get in the way of their plans, well that just wouldn't do. When a single mother did not like her daughter's new boyfriend, she kicked him out of the house. She got a friend to come and threaten him, you know, East Coast style. And then she even filed charges against him. You think that would stop him? It would not. The couple only saw one way out of this, but it's probably not what you think. This makes no sense, but tragedy and stupidity rarely do. Please subscribe to see new videos every week now. Let's give it a good. This whole story takes us to just outside Sacramento, California, to a town called El Dorado Hills. That's a good ass name for a town. Does it live up to it? Uh, yeah, actually. By all accounts, it does. It's a small but growing town with a very connected community, and it's lively. It's got a real spirit, and as the name suggests, it's a wealthy place nestled in the foothills of the Sierras. On one side you've Lake Tahoe, the national forests, the mountains. On the other side, the Central Valley. It was in that town, the year 2009, that Joanne Witt, 47 years old, and her 14-year-old daughter, Tyler Witt, lived. In a nice house just sitting off Folsom Lake, on the northern side of town. Joanne was smart as a whip, came from a big family that were well-to-do, and Joanne worked as a civil engineer for the county. Her young daughter, Tyler, went to Oak Ridge High School. And things were... okay. See, it was just Joanne and Tyler. The dad, he was never in the picture at all. And things were rocky between them at best. Always had been. Joanne always wanted a child, not so much a partner. And so she was so happy to be raising Tyler by herself, and she always had the support of her own family close by. Joanne was very close with her parents, Norb and Judy, but... When Tyler was five years old, she was taken from Joanne, after Joanne hit her, and as she grew, Tyler would repeatedly run away from home, crash with friends, that sort of thing. They did not get on well. CPS would be called to the home a number of times. It seems weirdly that Tyler would call 911, pretending to be her own mother, Joanne, saying that her daughter was beating her. 911. Um, excuse me, I need to report vandalism and, um, physical abuse. When did this happen? Um, my daughter, Tyler Witt, has physically assaulted me and she's vandalizing my home. Where is she right now? She's upstairs. Do you need to go to a safe place? No, I can go outside. How old is your daughter? She's 14. Did she assault you also? Yes, she did. It's some weird shit. Then during that same call, Joanne, the real Joanne, came on the line and she in fact was injured. Tyler was beating up her mother, then calling 911, pretending to be her mother, to get rid of herself. Hello? Yes? That was my daughter. Is her name Joanne? Are you safe? I don't know. Okay, are you injured at all? Yeah, I'm injured. Okay. It seems Joanne was trying to do everything she could for her daughter, to, to support her, to love her. Sometimes she obviously went a little bit too far, but she just wanted the best for her, and she didn't want her to leave. She didn't want to, you know, her to be taken away. She gave Tyler everything. There were only the two of them in this massive five-bedroom house with a pool. They had vacations, piano lessons, horseback riding, you name it. But nothing worked. Everything was just a band-aid for their relationship. It was then, June 15, 2009, a Monday, that Joanne's boss could not get through to her. Joanne hadn't showed up for work, and calls to her were just, like, ringing out. And the thing was, Joanne had been a no-show at work the Friday before, also. When she didn't show up for work on Friday, they thought, okay, you know, maybe she's off doing things, you know, with her daughter, or whatever. But then the weekend passes, and she's a no-show on Monday, also. Calls are going nowhere. They even went, knocked on her door. The house was dead quiet. Something was off. So her boss called her parents, Norb and Judy, who had just returned from traveling the country in an RV. Her parents said, oh, you know, we're not too far away, we'll go check on it, we have a key to enter the house. But Judy's boss said, you know, I've, I'm once to the head, I've already called the cops just to do a welfare check and just to be sure, because 
I mean, if the parents haven't heard anything else, then something's definitely weird. Outside the home, police didn't see anything strange. Her car was in her garage, and they eventually gained entry. Walking around, nothing strange or out of place. That was until they reached the master bedroom. Lying half on the bed, under the sheet, was a body. And the sheet was blood red. It was Joanne. She had been stabbed to death with a very large gaping injury to her neck and defensive wounds on her hands and fingers. It looked like she had been butchered. In the house, there was no sign of Tyler at all. And thinking back to some reports Joanne had made just previously, they began to think that Tyler may have been kidnapped from the home. From how the scene looked and the fact that Joanne hadn't shown up to work on Friday, she had been killed and Tyler had been taken days ago. They were a good few steps behind on this case. See, five days earlier, Joanne had reported the statutory rape of her 14-year-old daughter Tyler by a 19-year-old fella named Stephen Culver. In fact, it seemed like, from the scene, Joanne had filed those charges the day before she was murdered. Well, we know that this is a true bombshell in what El Dorado County investigators were calling a true murder mystery yesterday. Just minutes ago here at the Sheriff's Department, they did confirm indeed that a 14-year-old girl and her boyfriend are the prime suspects in the murder of a 40 five-year-old mother in El Dorado Hills. In fact, just minutes ago, they released photos of the two who are now wanted. There are arrest warrants for these two teenagers now. On the right, that is the daughter, 14-year-old Tyler Marie Witt. According to sheriff's deputies, her boyfriend is 19-year-old Stephen Paul Culver. He also goes by the alias of Boston. They say they have reason to believe they are now in the Bay Area and that they have changed their appearance. 19-year-old Stephen Culver and 14-year-old Tyler Witt had met about six months before all of this, back in January 2009. They had been introduced at a local coffee shop by a mutual friend, and they hit it off. See, they were both part of the, like, no one understands me, man, local goth, faggy jeans, dyed black, Jack Skellington stuff, that, that local scene. Stephen, who went by Boston, Everybody just called him Boston because the reason they called him Boston is because he had a childhood speech impediment, which made him sound like he was from Boston. Which, all right. He had just graduated from the same high school Tyler was now attending, and they bonded over this and that, music, anime, school, all that. Stephen was now attending a local college, and he was working at a restaurant, and he was trying to impress girls, which were clearly way too young for him. He also dreamed of being a maths teacher, which, I mean, from his interest in women, it's a good thing he. Yeah, that did not. They quickly became, you know, inseparable. Tyler, the impressionable young girl. Steven, uh, well, he sucks. It was in March, though, that their relationship became physical. That is when shit hit the fan. See, Steven lived in town with his dad, but in April, Steven's dad was selling the house and he was getting out of state. He was up and at him, right? So, but Steven, he worked in town, he was studying in town, and his new girlfriend, who was again waiting over him, was in town, so Stephen didn't want to leave. So Tyler had a brilliant idea she took to her mother, Joanne. She said, you know, we have this big five bedroom house. Um, how about we make a little bit extra scarrow? We rent out one of the rooms to this guy I know named Stephen Culver. Now, of course, when Tyler came up with this whole idea, she told her mother that, ah, oh, you know, Stephen, he's just more like a brother. He's just a friend. In fact, he's actually gay. So you don't have to worry about, you know, anything weird going on here at all. And so Joanne said, yeah, and she did not suspect a thing. So now you had Stephen living with his lover and paying his lover's mother 500 bucks a month for the privilege of being able to do so. This is disturbing as shit already, and it will not end well. When he moved in, though, Stephen seemed like a good influence on Tyler. She had stopped running away. The mom and daughter didn't fight so much. He helped her with school. But, of course, as you can imagine, as soon as Joanne was out of the room or as soon as she was out of the house, well, they were obsessed with each other. Star-crossed lovers and all that young teenage shite. Although, I mean, Steven should be a bit old for this. They also did more than just, you know, uh, that. They, they smoked devil's lettuce together, they snorted to devil's dandruff, they did pills together. One time Joanna even found Steven's little stash of drugs in the house. Joanna was obviously pretty pissed off that this was in the same house as her young teenage daughter and the fact that he would be doing it under her roof. But Stephen managed to convince Joanne that the drugs she had found, his drugs, were, ah, uh, you know, 
Just minding them for a friend, definitely not mine. But and Joanne just so happy with how peaceful things seemed in the house, she was like, all right, I'll give you the benefit of the doubt. However, the very next day after she discovered drugs in her house, Joanne just so happened to come home from work early. She came into the house. She was like, you know, Tyler, Tyler, she, she, no answer. She was looking for Tyler. She went up to Tyler's room, opened the door. Tyler was not in her bedroom, nor in like the living room or dining room or anywhere else. So then Joanne went to Stephen's room. She knocked on the door and as she did, she heard rummaging coming from inside Stephen's room. Then Stephen opened the door. It's only in his underwear. Joanne thought, oh, hell no. She barged in and then inside the closet in Stephen's room, she opened the door. Tyler was in there. Tyler was naked. Joanne was shocked and pissed. She was so stunned that later that same day, she ordered Stephen into the car with her and they took a ride. And she openly asked him what was going on between the two of them. He admitted their relationship to her. He admitted that it was wrong and that it was illegal. And so Joanne said, well, you're 19, she's 14. If you stop seeing her and get the hell out of my house, I won't press charges. Stephen, he agreed to leave. And the very next day, two of Joanne's friends from work, they came over and they gave Stephen the old, what are you doing with this girl who's way too young for you? And uh, if you don't stop, East Coast style, we're gonna sort you out East Coast style, which sleep with the fishes or whatever. They're gonna cook him in a big load of pasta. Who knows what that means? But guess what? Stephen did not end it. He crashed with a friend and every time Joanne left the house or it was late and she was asleep, Stephen would sneak over. Then one day in early June, Joanne found Tyler's diary and she was a very good little writer. She wrote down everything, including the sexual liaisons they had, what they did together, how they were in love with each other, that they wanted to get married. But most of all, they needed to get Joanne out of the picture so they could be together. Joanne gave this to the police as proof of their sexual relationship, told police about finding Tyler hiding in his bedroom, and then proceeded to file charges against Stephen Culver for statutory rape. I walked upstairs, saw that my daughter's door was open, she's nowhere in the house, and his door is closed and he's in his room. I knocked on the door and I heard the shuffling inside. So I opened up the door and there's my daughter holding a top naked like this. This was on June 10th. This could be charged as either a misdemeanor or a felony. The DA would decide, but regardless would likely lead to prison time for Stephen. When Tyler was informed of this, she was distraught. Not her amazing Stephen, no, not him. This gentleman, he goes by Boston? Yeah. How would you describe your and Boston's relationship? He was like a big brother to me, but we were very close friends. Then what did it turn into? I started to have feelings for him and then kind of clicked in my head, oh my God, he's five years older than me. Okay. Your mom said that uh, she caught you and him in his room and you were undressed? No. Never happened? No. He's like a big brother to me. She continued to deny to the police when questioned, as did Stephen. What's your relationship with her? She's like a sister to me. I understand she's 14. I understand all this. I'm very, very scared at the moment. You need to be honest because it, it'll look a lot better if you just come out clean. And they decided they were gonna run away together. The plan? They were gonna run away to San Francisco together and there end their own lives by eating rat poison. But before they would do that, well, the very next night when Joanne fell asleep, Tyler let Stephen into the house one final time. And one of them was carrying a knife. They felt betrayed by Joanne, and so even though they planned to end their own lives, they wouldn't let Joanne continue with hers. She wouldn't stop them now. Even though she had already filed charges against Stephen, and they had already planned to end their own This doesn't make any sense. I don't get it at all, but yeah, that was the plan. Now, after Joanne's body was found, the police didn't know how involved Tyler was. They thought, because she was so young, that Stephen had coerced her into the sexual relationship killed Joanne when discovered, and then kidnapped Tyler. Not quite. An APB was put out for the young couple, and the media circus began in El Dorado Hills. The morning of June 12th, Stephen and Tyler left the Witt house for the final time. They then went to Stephen's uh, dad's house. It was empty because he was, he was selling it, and they burned all their clothes. 
They then met up with some friends and hung out with friends for the day. And the friends would later say, not a bother on them. They were happy out. Some crack that day. They then dyed their hair black. And after doing some more drugs, they showed one of the friends the bloody knife they'd used to murder Joanne. They then fled to San Francisco. This was Friday. Joanne wasn't discovered till Monday. Now, in San Francisco, things didn't exactly go according to plan. So, see, they checked into the Holiday Inn in downtown San Francisco. They did some sightseeing around the city. Because, I mean, you know, you may as well. Then they went into their hotel room and they had a lot of rat poison. They mixed it in with red velvet cake they had. And then they started gobbling it up. But red velvet cake is, like, really heavy. You know, you can't really eat too much of it, so... It turns out they just didn't eat enough of it to die because of the, there was they didn't eat enough of the poison rather than just like I don't know swallowing the poison some other way. Then they were like, okay, how about we slit our wrists? Stephen was not a fan of that one. He's like, oh, it's kind of sore. Jump off the roof, Tyler. She was afraid of heights. <sighs> Man, can't get anything right here. So instead, they just kind of like hung out for a bit. Then, walking the streets one day, a cop spotted them and recognized them from the bulletin. Stephen and Tyler were soon arrested while changing clothes behind a dumpster at a mall. Not exactly this whole romantic, epic thing I guess they had envisioned. Nope. Got arrested while changing her clothes in a piss-smelling alleyway behind a dumpster. Good afternoon, I'm Adrian Bankert. We begin with breaking news in the El Dorado Hills murder mystery. Law enforcement in the Bay Area have arrested the two teenage murder suspects. Authorities in San Bruno, that's south of San Francisco, took them into custody earlier this morning. When questioned, Tyler had no idea her mother was dead. You gotta be shitting me. What happened? They tried to run away. The Boston decided that they didn't want to live there anymore and decided to just go down to Francisco to eat together. I was so upset just because my mom, she wanted me to talk to a detective about something Boston had did that he didn't, and I didn't want to talk to him. Was this in reference to the diary? Yeah. And you were saying that whatever was being alleged was, was incorrect and you and your mom were, were arguing about that? Yeah. Let's get down to the point here. Why are you here? Why? Because you tried to run away. What other reasons? Been arrested for murder. What? Who did I murder? Your mother. <laughs> I'm dead. We are. Dead. We don't. We don't need to play this. We already know that you know that your mother's dead. Give me that. You pull it together. Just a moment. <laughs> Talk to me about your mother. <laughs> Attorney and you want me gone. Okay. That we can do. And unfortunately, we can't talk to you again. Good luck. Stephen was charged with first degree murder. Tyler, they didn't know yet the level of her involvement. Didn't take long to figure it out, though. And Tyler was charged with first degree murder and then charged as an adult. But who had dealt the blow? Well, DNA was found on Joanne's body, male DNA, but it was minuscule. It, it seems it wasn't enough to determine if it was in fact Stephen's DNA. Tyler cut a deal with the prosecution and agreed to testify against Stephen. And in return, her charge would be downgraded from first degree murder to second degree murder. Special circumstances in the killing of her own mother, Joanne Witt. Witt and Culver are charged with killing Joanne Witt in her El Dorado Hills home sometime between June 11th and 12th, 2009. Prosecutors say that Joanne was upset about her daughter's sexual relationship with the older Culver and had turned over evidence to the Sheriff's Department. That would be the difference of 25 years to life or 15 years in prison, which, I mean, turns out she, I guess she didn't like him that much after all. And so Stephen's trial began in May 2011. The prosecution said that Tyler had drugged her mom and then let Stephen in. He went into Joanne's room. Tyler stayed outside with her fingers pressed into her ears, humming to herself. And he later came out some time later, covered in blood, with a single tear streaming down his face. 
That's Tyler's exact words, by the way. He was covered in blood with a single tear. I'm sure those aren't my chemical romance lyrics. The prosecution pushed that Stephen would be the one in jail due to the charges Joanne was filing. He was the older one, the more mature one, the one who, according to friends, enjoyed knives and enjoyed manipulating younger women. The defense, though, in turn, attacked Tyler's mental state as she was, you know, key witness for the prosecution. Or should I say, mental states? Because, get this, she was Tyler. She was an angel known as Alex, and she was a demon known as Toby, and each would take control of Tyler from time to time. It's fascinating stuff. Who was in control of Tyler that night, I wonder? He couldn't have better names though than Alex Toby, come on. Because when Stephen took the stand in his own defense, he said that when he arrived to the Wit House that night, Tyler was already covered in blood with a knife saying she did it. My mom is gone forever. Outside court, a surprise remark from another friend of Culver's who took the stand late this afternoon. Listen to what Dylan Deutsch told KCRA3 in an exclusive interview. I've known Tyler Witt for a long time and I have a feeling that she has more of a part in it than she's saying. I think she's guilty to be honest. I you think, think she, she did it, yeah. Tyler was saying Stephen had come over and he had murdered her mom. Stephen was saying he did go over, but the mom was already dead by Tyler's hand. Since the beginning, he has maintained his innocence, and then Friday afternoon, she pled guilty to murdering her mother, and what young girl would plead guilty to murdering her mother if she didn't do it? Culver's attorney says he was a victim of wits too, and revealed for the first time publicly his defense. In a sense, yes. My, my, my position is that he came to the house after the fact. That's our position. Uh, what uh, The homicide had already occurred before he got there. Witt will now testify against Culver. The defense also found a story in Tyler's diary. Remember, she was a good uh, little scribbler. And it, it was this short story from the twisted mind of Tyler Witt. And it was called The Killer and His Raven. The story was about a young man and his belle who um, they wanted to be together, but the mother was a real oppressive bitch and, and you know, wouldn't let them be together. So at the end of the story, blah, 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 long story short, fast forward, they killed the mother. Sounds vaguely familiar. But I should say the short story, The Killer and His Raven, it's set in medieval times. So completely different. Culver's attorney also told the jury that after her mother banned her from seeing Culver anymore, Tyler Witt wrote, quote, if my mom doesn't let me see Boston, I swear to God, I will kill her. Her diary also expressed numerous times how she wanted Joanne gone. After four hours of deliberation, Stephen Boston Culver was found guilty of murder and special circumstances of lying in wait, use of a deadly weapon, and killing a witness. Now, it was relating to the statutory rape charge. He was sentenced to life in prison without the possibility of parole. Stephen Culver had a dark side. He took a 14-year-old girl and turned, into, turned her into a heavy drug user, sex addict, and murderer. May he rot in the hell he wrote so often about in his journals. My hope is on the prison system, that the prison system will somehow create a slow and painful death. Young men like Mr. Culver are five times as likely to be attacked and brutalized in prison. And I, I actually find that to be a comforting statistic. They're ten times as more likely to incur deadly sexual diseases. I just hope he has a... Uh uh, good luck with his new friends in prison, and I hope they embrace him warmly. Tyler Witt was sentenced to 15 years, as agreed with the prosecution. She was granted parole in August 2022. Whether the pair ever really intended to end their own lives, I think is debatable. I don't think they really did. I think it was probably more likely just some teen angst kind of bullshit. They just wanted it all. You know, it was all consuming for them and be damned everybody else. Tyler and her mom didn't have a good relationship in the first place. And so Stephen, Stephen came in, you know, her grooming knight in shining armor. And once it looked like he might be gone, mom had to go. And then of course it comes to trial. Re real consequences of, you know, what they had done. Because she clearly never gave a shit about her mother. But as soon as it was like, you know, 25 years or 15 years, she was like, for 15 years, yeah, actually, you know what, um, that guy kind of sucked, actually. Her own mother wasn't enough to get her to ditch him, but it turns out an extra 10 years in prison was. Thank you so much for watching. Uh, it really means the world to me. I uh, hope you enjoyed this little video, and uh, yeah, here, listen, the next little video will be up in a couple of days, so please give it a go. But until then, uh, please take care of each other. 
please take care of yourselves because I love you. Mike out.